Oh, well, good afternoon. Um, when I look out, I realize I've reached the age of metal. Uh, silver in my hair, gold in my teeth, and lead in my backside. So it's great to be with you all. Um, yeah, I, um, Dave asked me to look at, g give you a frame on the emergence of modern combined arms warfare. And what I thought I'd do is just give an overview, which I'm not really going into too much detail, because I know that, uh, that the two other speakers are going to talk about the Battle of Cambra, which is the key, key event. Um, three themes. First, uh, to define combined arms. I know for some of you this will be like teaching you to suck eggs, but bear with me. Um, and looking from combined arms very briefly, from gunpowder to machine gun, and, and then into World War I. And then looking at the legacy of combined arms. Um, we've just come out of 15 years of counterinsurgency, and uh, uh, there are some people who still believe that combined arms is one of those sorts of things armies don't need. All you have to do is a bit of light infantry and counterinsurgency. I'm not in that school, but there are people out there who will argue that case, and I, I hope to sort of put a, a spear through that. So defining combined arms. Um, the concept of combined arms, it's an old concept, as most of you will know. Um, you know, you only have to look at the uh, ancient warfare to realize that generals wanted to put their chariots, their archers, and their spearmen into some kind of coordination so you would have a maximum effect from your weapon systems. Certainly that was the case in the armies of the ancient world. But before gunpowder, of course, you didn't have that vital thing, which was to have the, the shock element in terms of firepower, um, uh, in terms of mobile artillery to facilitate fire and movement, which is really the key that you need. So pre-industrial combined arms warfare really involved uh, formation warfare of infantry, artillery, and cavalry, but that did not really emerge until uh, the 17th century, um, until artillery was in a condition where you could actually, it could become wheeled and was mobile enough to be used. Um, so let me give you a definition here about combined arms warfare. Uh, military operations undertaken by a fighting organization composed of either two or three of the principal combat arms infantry, artillery, or, or cavalry, or armor. And of course, since that, since that definition, and it's a 20th century definition, you, we might add engineers, air defense, artillery, fighter bombers, any number of close air support. And of course, as you know, um, the real aim in combined arms is that the whole is greater than the parts. Um, it, you can bring much more effect to bear um, by orchestrating all of your weapon systems. Um, and fires and maneuver are particularly well blended to create the dilemma for the enemy. So the more you fire, the more you maneuver, the more you mix and match, the better it is. And for those of you um, who've done exercises or been in uh, on operations will know this well. So where do we go from, from musket to machine gun? Uh, let me just give you a very, very brief snapshot of combined arms in combat history. It really starts for us in a modern sense in, during the Thirty Years' War. And the army that develops it is uh, an unusual army in the sense that we don't usually think of the Swedes as being great soldiers. Um, we tend to think of them as being uh, more in the welfare world or at best uh, tennis players or at best uh, rather pale imitations of human beings that operate at the UN. But in the 17th century, they were the leading army in Europe. Um, and in terms of firearms technology and military organization, uh, the, if you look at the history of Gustavus Adolphus and the Swedish army, this is where you will find the origins of combined arms. And of course, the composition was infantry brigades made up of musketeers and pikemen. Mm -hmm. uh, mobile field artillery, um, for the first time you're able to move artillery around um, because calibers and so forth were calibrated, and heavy shock cavalry. And what Gustavus was able to do was combine fire, maneuver, and shock into a single war fighting system. And when his armies landed in northern Germany at the beginning of the 17th century, the early years of the 17th century, they were, it was the most organized army in Europe probably since the Romans. And uh, they were up against the Spanish Tercios. So the Tercio had been the um, fundamental fighting unit um, throughout most of the 16th century, used mainly by the Spanish. And it was, as, you, as many of you know, a formation made up of pikemen. Um, once mobile artillery came along, you could shred these uh, tercios, which is what precisely what happened. Um, and the key battle, the key battle when you see, really see the change from the Spanish tercios to the Swedish um, combined arms system, which is then taken up by the French, 
uh, is at Breitenfeld in Germany in 1631, where Gustavus confronts the Catholic League army of Count Tilly. And the Catholic League army was made up of the traditional heavy infantry squares, the tercios, which the Spanish had used to become the, the leading uh, military power in Europe in the 16th century. But they were up against the Swedes who combined their musketeers, their pikemen, their cavalry, and their field guns to, to literally, literally smash the tercios and decisively defeat the Catholic forces. And this is the battle that makes, um, uh, really makes Gustavus' uh, reputation as one of the great captains, the so-called Lion of the North. He's later killed at Lutzen, uh, leading his uh, cavalry in the charge, but his reputation has yeah. endured over the centuries. Um, so that we have what you might loosely call the Breitenfeld system um, during the age of battles. Breitenfeld and later Lutzen basically showed how infantry, artillery, and cavalry could be blended in a battle. So you find that the Swedish innovations are taken up, they are improved, they are polished by European soldiers from Marshal Turin right through Marlborough to Frederick the Great. All of them in some way combine artillery, um, uh, uh, infantry, and, and cavalry. Um, so in the Napoleonic Wars, we get yet another um, major innovation, which is the corps d'armée system, or the army corps system, which is developed by Napoleon, which in fact is simply a composite force made up of divisions um, of infantry, cavalry, and artillery, and it's almost an independent force. And these are able to converge on the, on the sound of the guns. Um, and as you all know, Napoleon was by, by, here by, by profession an artillery officer. So um, he knew the power of, of the guns. So uh, as David Chandler puts it in his definitive book, The Campaigns of Napoleon, published in 1966, but never been better. The corps d'armée system, he says, was the French secret weapon of the Napoleonic Wars. And I think he's right. It really was a significant tactical development in the field. And then we get the Industrial Revolution comes along. This massive revolution which changes warfare decisively from about the 1840s to about the, to, to, to well into the First World War. We get the coming of steam power, which revolutionizes land, land movement. You all need to remember, of course, that a movement on land was by horse and foot. The coming of the railway was a strategic revolution. Expanded the scale of the battlefield because all of a sudden you could move troops in large numbers by rail. You could mobilize. Um, you, you had much greater command integration over distance. Electric telegraph allowed you to, to really start to experiment with a very primitive form of, of, um, of what you might call mission command. And of course, the big thing was the revolutionization of firepower rifled weapons, and later, of course, machine guns. And we get the obsolescence of the key arm. The key arm of decision for a long period of time was the heavy shock cavalry. But once you develop a battlefield which um, has many uh, rifled weapons on it, breech loaders and an automatic uh, rifles and machine guns, and cavalry, uh, artillery, of course, the arm blanche, the, uh, the cavalry lose, their, they begin to obsolesce as a decisive arm. So uh, let me just give you one, uh, one example of how, this, how things change. If you were at the Battle of Borodino in 1805, 1812 rather, um, it was eight kilometers frontage. So Napoleon could ride along that frontage with his couriers and give orders, get a visual understanding of the battlefield. If you shoot forward to 1905, and we have the Battle of Mukden between the Japanese and the Russians, the battlefield or the front is 155 kilometers. It's impossible for any one general to control it. You have to use telegraph, you have to devolve, and that's where we get the origins of the, uh, of the operational level of war. So uh, the distributed battlefield comes about because of firepower. And the first army to master it, of course, are the Prussians. They develop what we call operatif. They bring the railway, telegraph, and firepower together. The problem is they, they grab all this technology, but their actual military theory remains classical in origin. So the models are still Hannibal, the models are still Turin, the models are even still Gustavus. So the Prussian army develops the staff operation. They graft, if you like, industrial methods onto the Breitenfeld system. And they look for the Battle of Annihilation, what they call the Vernichtungsschlacht. German is a beautiful language. You can feel yourself being beaten up when you, when you say that word, Vernichtungsschlacht. <laughs> Um, they beat the less industrialized Austrians and French in the 1860s into the 1870s. And all armies then, uh, you know, they, they then end up imitating the Prusso-German approach to industrial warfare. 
Uh, for a long time, the French had been the model. Now the, the Germans were the model, and everybody copies them. So what this leads to in the end is that when armies all copy each other and are all using the same technology, we have a period in military theory from 1870 to 1914 where there's a real crisis in military theory, where the military theory actually lags behind the industrial means of making war. You have strategic mobility through railways, but it's not matched by tactical mobility in the field, because tactical mobility remains as it was in the ancient world, by foot and by horse. We have not yet got to mechanization, so there is a divergence, if you like, between strategic mobility and tactical immobility. And of course, the battlefield itself is is characterized by the volume of direct fire, which eclipses the capacity for movement. So on this battlefield, your ability to charge, your ability to, uh, to uh, if you like, apply mass is limited by the sheer volume of firepower that will come against you, which of course is how you get the empty battlefield. Troops go to ground, the battlefield expands. So what it foreshadows is attrition and stalemate not annihilation and rapid decision, which of course has always been the, the military ideal, certainly in the West. The ideal is Waterloo, the ideal is Breitenfeld, Lutzen, uh, any other number of those, uh, those great classical battles. So when we get to World War I, what we end up with is really a killing ground, where we have defensive fire, fire power is much, more, much greater than your offensive capacity. So, the Breitenfeld triad is simply uh, shattered on, on, on in the early years of the Western Front. This system had been refined one way or the other with lots of modifications over three centuries, but it is almost deadlocked by, by, by trench warfare. So all the offenses from Verdun to the Somme, they, they fail, they lack, the, the, there's a technical incapacity of indirect artillery fire to suppress defenses and depth. You simply don't have the accuracy at this point. So penetration and break-in of enemy lines by unprotected infantry using the Battle of Rupture, as the French used to call it, all tend to falter. And of course, I'm sure many of you have read Tim Travers' book, on The Killing Ground, which is one of the great books on the First World War, um, and yeah, supplemented by any number of books. And the books of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Cittino are very good as well on this. So um, I like, rather like the, uh, the uh, phrase of Jonathan Bailey, the British Major General, who I think from memory was an artillery officer. He came out to Australia about 10 years ago and spoke at one of the chief's conferences. And he wrote a great piece, a short, powerful essay um, by a practitioner which was called The Birth of the Modern Style of Warfare, which he traced to the First World War. He said, look, the emergence of industrial age combined arms comes in 1917-18, where after the three years of of, of blood-soaked battlefields, many of the thinking and much of the innovation starts to bear fruit. We get the coming of it in pre uh, predicted indirect artillery fire, sound ranging, ranging flash spotting, aerial photography. Uh, it gives you the capacity to, uh, to deliver shells with great accuracy. And then, of course, protected mobility, the coming of tanks and armor. The invention of radio and close air support. You can see the revival of combined arms during this period. And of course, infantry, artillery, fire, any number of support weapons, protected mobility, all come together. So modern combined arms warfare fuses mobility with protection for fire and maneuver. And again, there's plenty of literature on this. So the first to, to, to really experiment with this, I'd argue with really the Germans to begin with, Operation in Michael in 1918, the Germans in combined arms. They created a system of, um, uh, an all-arms tactical system of artillery fire which was coordinated with stormtroops. Their, 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 their approach was to use stormtroops to infiltrate the trenches using grenades, flamethrowers, and so forth. Uh, and they launched that huge artillery infantry uh, offensive um, in 1918, which um, shattered the Allies to begin with. But what the Germans lacked, they, they lacked um, protected mobility for exploitation. They couldn't keep, they couldn't sustain it because eventually the defense would reconstitute itself. So they, they lacked that te tactical technical mix of movement and protection and fire, which meant that in the end the German offensive petered out. So the real, the real invention, I'd argue the real conceptual invention of combined arms begins with the British in, in uh, the period 1917-1918. It's the BEF who really bring together the tactics and the technical means to break trench warfare because what they look at is all arms. 
a ground, an air ground model of warfare, armor, aircraft, infantry, operating under the long black arms of the artillery. So the armored vehicles they develop are used as direct fire vehicles to protect infantry assaults. And of course, there's a lot of uh, support weapons like Lewis guns and rifle grenades and so forth. And again, the literature is rich on this. Uh, Monash, I think, is, uh, is the great pioneer of modern combined arms. Um, somehow that uh, slide has become, um, the formatting's gone a bit strange, but you'll get the, uh, get the uh, this is a quote from the Australian Victories in France where if Monash talks about the true role of the infantry is not to expend itself on physical effort or wither away in front of machine guns. It is to move forward under the mechanical using all the mechanical uh, aids that are, are there, all the mechanical resources, machine guns, tanks, mortars, and aeroplanes. And Monash, in some ways, in many ways, is the conceptual architect of this kind of warfare, even though he was, he was not in command of all the armies. So I like what he said about uh, the orchestra, and it's a wonderful metaphor for combined arms. A modern battle plan, he said, it's like a score for an orchestra. Um, the various arms and units are instruments. The tasks they perform are musical phrases and each individual unit must make its entry precisely at the proper moment. Generalship, therefore, becomes like very high-skilled conducting. You conduct the various instruments, and it's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's a marvelous uh, metaphor, and I think a very highly relevant one for today. So the testing ground, as you all know, is Hamel and Amiens. Um, Hamel, of course, is the model all-arms battle where Monash uses tanks and artillery and infantry with great skill. And Amiens, of course, is famous because it's the black day of the German army, where the Germans lose 7,000 troops and 450 field guns in a very, very quick uh, operation. And it really begins, it marks the beginning of the famous 100 Days Campaign, which leads to Allied victory in 1918. So if you look at the 100 Days Campaign, of course, again, it's that mechanical war. It's uh, tanks, artillery, well-equipped infantry, inflict strategic defeat on the Germans by a succession of breakthroughs, uh, breakthrough battles on the Western Front. Uh, and as Shelford Bidwell and Dominic Graham have put it in their wonderful book, Firepower, uh, written many years ago, but still wonderful, 100 Days was a milestone in the history of land warfare because we see the first high-performance teams working together with high-performance machines. Again, it's that indus industrial warfare coming together with uh, um, new ways of, of, of fighting. So what's the legacy and lessons of all this? Let me just conclude with a few uh, observations. Um, we, really, we see the Breitenfeld system is recovered, if you like, in 1918. Um, the 100 Days campaign is very similar in terms of its impact to uh, Gustavus Adolphus's campaign in northern Germany in 1631. Like the Swedes for the gunpowder age, the British provide the model for all arms war warfare for the industrial age. So the blueprint um, the blueprint that they had in 1918 was later refined uh, uh, by J JFC Fuller into Plan 1919. And in fact, it, it anticipates everything that's going to happen in the 1930s and early 40s. And as Fuller as puts it in his book on warfare, The Conduct of War, in modified form, uh, Plan 1919 really was the, uh, the, was the blueprint for the Blitzkrieg that the Germans developed. So what about combined arms warfare 18 to 45? Um, again, the refinement there start, really starts to occur mainly in the Soviet Union and Germany. The British lose their lead mainly because they don't fund combined arms. As you all know, Fuller and Liddell Hart and others were all screaming about reforming the British Army, making it into a combined arms force. But because of the 10-year rule, because of lack of funding, it was the Soviets and the Germans who moved ahead uh, and began to refine it. The Blitzkrieg gave the Germans a temporary lead in mechanization, but I'd argue the Blitzkrieg is essentially a tactical method. Um, um, it, it lacks the uh, sophistication of what the Soviets developed in terms of deep operations where they use mass tank armies to really push in depth and, uh, and, as, and width. And I think the test between the two systems, between the Blitzkrieg system and the deep operations of the Soviets, really occurs at the Battle of Kursk. And if you study that battle in detail, you will see that's the Soviet army employing a combined arms defense blunts the German army. And the German army never really recovers from Kursk, Kursk in 1943. So um, I love this quotation from the movie. 
um, where you, some of those of you who have seen the movie Patton will know that there's a, this battle early on in the film where Patton's taking on Rommel, and uh, he's sitting up there with all his guns and his, 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 uh, his, uh, his tanks, his combined armed force, and the Germans are moving forward with tanks and with infantry, but there's no artillery support, they're moving forward, so uh, Patton gets his artillery to open up, and he, they basically flatten the Germans, and as he says this, you know, as he's looking through his binoculars, he says, Rommel, you magnificent bastard, I read your book. So it's, it's a great scene, um, probably fictional, but nonetheless it captures the whole spirit of combined arms. So the perils of neglecting combined arms, I'll give you a few examples, Korea, Yom Kippur, and Chechnya. Korea, those of you who've read the, or studied the Korean War will know Task Force Smith, this light force that the Americans left in uh, Korea, was overrun by North Korean forces using T-34 tanks to spearhead their attack. The Yom Kippur War, a disastrous early start for the Israelis because guess what, they used an all tank attack. They didn't have infantry supporting. And they were hit by any number of um, uh, surface to air missiles, precision guided munitions. And in Chechnya, if you look at the early uh, part of Chechnya, uh, certainly that first campaign in the early 90s to the mid 90s, the, the Russians get, or they, their tank forces get demolished in the, in the Battle of, of Grozny because they don't use infantry screens. So they, they really can't knock out the uh, Chech Chechens who are using RPGs and any number of missile, missile uh, weapons. Um, from Afghanistan to unified land operations. Um, uh, Stephen Biddle's uh, study of the early part of the Afghanistan campaign was it's a really useful thing to remind ourselves of the importance of combined arms. Because in that early period when uh, we first went into Afghanistan in 2002, we did not have the firepower to really deal with the, uh, the, the, the Mujahideen who were hiding in the, 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 the Tora Bora. So um, we didn't have that combination of fires at skill ground maneuver. And uh, this was a warning to us because, of course, bin Laden got away. We didn't have the firepower. And again, um, this, this has influenced the, the current US doctrine, unified land operations, which is still extant, which really has two major features, combined arms warfare, or combined arms maneuver, and wide area security as the core competencies for American warfighting well into the 21st century. And again, to take yet another example, those, some of you may have studied the French campaign in Mali. This is a very interesting campaign because uh, in open land, open uh, ground, most of it's desert, the French, with it, using a fairly small force but a very integrated force, went in, to f in Mali to fight against an ISIL Tureg force, m much of it which were, was mounted on, on you know, the usual kind of utes or uh, Toyota land cruisers with machine guns and so forth. But this, the French force used airborne forces, mechanized battalions, air power, and when they did the lessons learned from this operation in 2015, and I was at a conference where the French general who'd led that operation um, basically gave us a paraphrase of that quotation where he said, look, uh, the, way, the reason we succeeded was because we had joint and combined arms operations. We had reach, we had firepower, we had mobility and armor. And these are the key factors for any army. Uh, and I, I think he's right. And if you look at Russia's war in the Ukraine, just uh, to finish up, um, we've seen advanced combined arms warfare used by the Russians in the Ukraine uh, in a way that's not been seen since 1945 in terms of the, the, the sheer numbers that have been used. Um, if you look at the Russian artillery, we had conventional and thermobaric and cluster warheads used with devastating effect. Um, as you will know with their armor, the T-class tanks running from the 72s right up to the 90s. Any number of uh, 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 guns and missiles with enhanced reactive armor. And what the Russians used, they used a lot of um, uh, um, uh, unmanned aerial systems to, to allow them to mass their indirect fires to destroy Ukrainian battalions. And if you had an infantry fighting vehicle on that battlefield, and unless it had reactive armor, it was gone. And that's a lesson for everybody who's in the cavalry business. If you're up against a peer competitor and it's thin-skinned, you are gonna die on this battlefield. That's one of the lessons that's come out of, again, of the, uh, the, the Ukrainian uh, battlefield. So let me end with um, a, a great quote from my colleague Steve Biddle in America. Steve Biddle's book, Military Power, is a wonderful discussion of combined arms. And he, he makes the case, and I think he's right, 
that we talk about revolutions in warfare, but really in the end, the only revolutionary change that would really make a, a really fundamental change to warfare is going to be one that makes terrain, dispersion, and combined arms disappear. And that's not going to happen anytime soon, despite deep strike weapons, that despite robotics, we are still going to have to have humans in the loop and on the loop and be able to bring both maneuver and firepower to, uh, to the battle. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, just to recap, it's Breitenfeld in the 1630s, right through to Amiens and then through to Mali and Ukraine today. Combined arms doesn't go away. It, it may change due to technology, but it doesn't change. And I think really the key thing for armies is to assess the interaction of technology and doctrine at, at every possible point as you move forward. You can't afford to, man, uh, to obsolesce in this business. You have to keep looking at the maneuver side, the protection side, and any, uh, any numbers of technology, but you have to have the doctrine and of course the human material to go with it. So do, uh, I'm a great believer that despite all the talk about robotics and unmanned systems, combined arms are unlikely to disappear. And um, I like to use a quotation from a Canadian colleague of mine, Dominic Graham, the late Dominic Graham, sadly. He says, look, when infantry companies disappear into the smoke, who shall save them? Themselves, they cannot save. You need guns, you need artillery, you need tanks. You have to bring everything together. It's the orchestra that Monash talked about. Okay, thank you very much.